of What's in Your Hand here at WHCR and also GHCR.NYC. There are two sister stations. And I want to thank my team. Grant Houses Community Radio. The Soul. Well, all right. This is WHCR. This is GHCR. Got 95.9 FM. And I want to thank my my team, uh, Engineer Doug Frazier, Stu Reed, and Carlton Davis, uh, uh, an uh, amazing team working together to make this thing happen. And I, What's In Your Hands, the name of my radio program. It's a pretty powerful, motivational show. We talk about success, achievement, reaching your goals, reaching your dreams, and having a magnificent life, and also having fun. And my guest today is the best-selling author of over 30 books, a professional speaker, has been on the stage with the likes of the legendary Zig Ziglar, General Colin Powell, Tony Robbins, one of the, a giant, giant in height and a giant in, in the motivational speaking industry. When he said he's not a motivational speaker, but in the personal development industry, Tony Robbins, Dr. Dennis Waitley, who's also a great teacher, and Christopher Reeves, Superman. Jim Stove has been on the stage with Superman. Doesn't get better than that. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest today, Jim Stovall. Good morning, Jim. How are you doing this morning? Man, I am doing great. This is going to be a wonderful show. If people could see behind the scenes what your people and my people had to do to get this on, you know this is going to be a great show right here. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So, Jim, uh, let's let's first of all, you're the author of over 30 books, is that correct? Yeah, in fact, I just released number 48 uh, this oh, 48 month. 48 books, uh, 48 books, right? Now, how many of your books have been turned into motion pictures? So far, eight, and there are two that have been uh optioned, and as soon as we get through this, uh little virus uh, situation, we're going to uh, uh, make those two films. Right. Now, at, before we before we started a recording, I, I, I explained to you, I was a boxer, but you were actually a football player. Yeah, I was a football player, and I, uh, I thought I was destined for the NFL, and then in a routine physical, I was uh, diagnosed with the condition that would cause me to be blind, and uh, I did a little quick research there, Ricky, and found out there aren't, there aren't any blind guys in the NFL. So uh, I gave that up. And then shortly after that, I discovered Olympic weightlifting, and I was our national champion uh, and got to finish my career as an Olympic weightlifter. Wow, awesome. So, now, wait a minute. You've written 48 books. Yeah. And you said you are blind? That is correct, yeah. Wow, that's that's amazing. You know, you know, sometimes people and you still have a, a, a big, a great appreciation for light in spite of. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I feel lucky. I feel blessed. I, you know, honestly, I get up every day and do what I love to do. And I don't know anybody I would trade places with. I, I feel like uh, I am just so fortunate to have the life I have. Wow. So, Jim, tell me, what is the difference between sight and vision. Great question, sir. Sight tells you where you are and what's around you. It's a very handy thing to have. I had it for the first half of my life. Sight tells you where you are and what's right around you. Vision tells you where you could be and what is possible. And if you ever have to make a choice between the two, as precious as sight is, vision is even more precious. It is a, it is a tremendous gift that we've been given, but so few people use it because they spend all time using their sight, and all they look at is their current circumstance right around them today instead of using vision to determine what's possible and what's out there in the future. Can, can a small child have vision? Yeah, I think most kids have vision. Most kids, I mean, they can do anything. They can they can pretend, they can play make-believe, they, they know it's going to happen, they see it. You know, I often do arena events where I speak to thousands of people, and I always ask them, if I were to ask for volunteers, and, and among you 10 or 12,000 people, 
How many would come down here on this stage? How many can sing or dance or draw a picture? You might get a handful out of that uh, 10,000 people. But if you put 10,000 kids in there, Ricky, if I said, how many of you can sing or dance or draw a picture? Every one of them can because they still believe in the possibilities. And then uh, we have to learn how to fail. We we were endowed with the seed of greatness from the time we came into this world, and we are taught to fail. Wow. I got a friend named uh, Jeffrey Vincent Noble. He says, we are all born to win, but conditioned to lose. Mm-hmm. To win. Yeah, that's what we were created for greatness. And... Um, you know, you mentioned boxing. Uh, I've had the privilege of meeting and interviewing some of the greatest people of the 20th and now the 21st century. Uh, across the office from me on one of my shelves is a boxing glove that was given to me, signed by Muhammad Ali. Yes. And people thought he was ignorant or obnoxious because he would run around saying, I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest of all times. And he said, you know, I believed that from the time I was a kid. I always believed that. And he said, I was just trying to pump myself up and remind myself who I am. And and he said, uh, and it just, they had to give me a chance to prove it. But uh, he said, when they put the belt on me, everybody knew I was the greatest of all times. Now, Jim, you were on the stage with the legendary Zig Ziglar. People, some people have never heard of who Zig Ziglar is. Can you kind of just give us a little brief piece about Zig Ziglar? Well, most of us that make a living on stage owe a great debt of gratitude to Zig Ziglar because he and a couple other guys, uh, Cabot Robert, Dennis Whaley, a couple of those guys kind of in the 60s and 70s created what we now know as the professional speaking business. And if you want to know about Zig Ziglar and if you want to change your life, read his book, See You at the Top. And it's probably the best thing I've ever read uh, on, on the subject. But uh, Zig was just quite simply one of the greatest platform guys of all time. Wow. So one of the things that I've been doing, uh, Jim, with some of my guests is I have been asking them, like, I, I'm a fan of basketball, too. I mean, I like football. Don't get me wrong. I do like football. But, I, you know, basketball, I've been using basketball as, as, the, as the backdrop. So what I've been asking them is, who is, because on, on, on the basketball court, there are five players. So, Jim, I would say, well, who was your starting five? So I've been asking my guests, who's your motivational success starting five? So, if, Jim, if you had to put five, motivational success champions out there, who would be your first five that you would pick, Jim? Well, uh, we just mentioned Zig Ziglar. He would be my point guard, I think. Oh. <laughs> and, and my off guard would be Dr. Dennis Whaley, the psychology of winning. And then uh, I got to put Tony Robbins in the middle, a great friend. And uh, also over there on the wall is a picture of he and I. And we were both inducted into the 10 Outstanding Young Americans a year apart. And uh, and if you ever talk to Tony, remind him I went in first. So uh, I always like to remind him of that. But uh, I would uh, recommend him. And if you want to read up about Tony, uh, read, uh, you know, Giant Steps. And then one of the great guys, Energy uh, intensity and everything. My power forward is going to be the one and only Les Brown because uh, <laughs> Les, uh, more than anybody I've ever seen, brings it all day, every day, and uh, there's no one any, any better. And on the uh, small forward, my my mentor, great speaker, the greatest basketball coach of all time, uh, the legendary coach John Wooden. Uh, you know, in a, in a sport that. Uh, where they go through March Madness, and the, there's a couple of guys that have won three championships, one that's won four. He won 10 out of 12, and no one's even ever approached that. And he had great players like Bill Walton and Kareem and those guys, and uh, you know, just, but just a great speaker, great author. And if you have a chance to read his uh, book on his pyramid of success, it's a game changer. So that's my starting five right there. I'll, I'll, I'll go to war with those five. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I listen because of because of Zig Ziglar. I don't have an alarm clock. 
Mm-hmm. I learned from you had an opportunity clock, what you got. There it is. An opportunity clock, that's right. And uh, Zig, man, I, mean, I love Zig Ziglar, man. The things that he uh, have taught us, have, a lot of that stuff has stuck with me. As a matter of fact, the way I answer my telephone, when someone calls me, I says, it's a great day. How may I help you? And I learned that from calling Zig Ziglar's office one day. And the young lady picked, answered the phone. It's a great day. How may I help you? That, I just couldn't believe that she would say something like that. And, I, and I've been using that ever since. Well, he was a great man, and uh, I was at his funeral. I gave one of the testimonies, his eulogy, and uh, wow. And uh, as I told people, when when we learn something, we change our own life. When we teach something, we change another person's life. But when you look around at Zig's funeral and you see all the people that are in our business, the same business you and I are in, Ricky, where we change people's life, when you teach people to teach, you change the world. So that's what Zig did. He just didn't learn something. He just didn't teach something. He taught people to teach, and that will go on forever and change the world. Uh, Just for your information, Jim, I love Jim Stovall and what he does and what he brings to the world. But, Jim, I have to correct you because Zig Ziglar, you, you can't have a funeral for Zig Ziglar. You can only have a life celebration for Zig Ziglar. Great point, and uh, we had, in <laughs> fact, they called it a homecoming graduation, and uh, and uh, Zig just went upstairs. Yeah, Zig don't get, you can't, how are you going to give Zig Ziglar a funeral? What? Excuse me? I'm, I mean, I'm still talking about Zig. He, he affected my life for the rest of my life. Always my will, test. and because of Zig impacting your life, think how many people you impact and then they impact, and, uh, you know, it, it, is, it is an amazing uh, ongoing stream of, uh, of success. Yeah, you know, uh, I have had many teachers. I have been blessed, Jim. I, I have to brag a little bit because of some of the people that I have seen up close, spoken to, been around, and learned from some of the best people that walked on this planet, you know, the Brian Tracy, the Zig Ziglar's, uh, Jim Rohn's, uh, the uh, Bob Proctor's, and Les Brown's, and the Dr. Dennis Kimbrough's, and the Willie Jollies, and the Herbert Harris's, and the Robert Craner's. Uh, I got to brag. I've met some amazing people in my lifetime. Let, let me give you my let me give you my starting five, uh, Jim. Oh, let's do it. Uh, my point guard would be Napoleon Hill. Yeah. And my my point guard, my off guard would be Jim Rohn. Mm-hmm. My center would be Les Brown. And my power forward would be a young lady by the name of uh, Sade Burrell. She's very young. She's an up and coming speaker. But just the other day, she, she like, I mean, she just touched me in a very special way. She, she was brought up in, she was brought up in a, uh, uh, a sheltering system. She was, she, you know, she was raised in the shelter. Her and her, all her brothers and sisters, I think it's like five or six of them, they all went in the shelter. Mm-hmm. The young lady's so powerful. So I got to put her at number four. And then the small four would be myself. And I got that go. from her. She put herself in her spot. I said, wait a minute. I got to put myself in there because of the work I've done which, you know, I, I'm on the team, so, you know, so I, I really appreciate her for that. So I put myself in the starting five, Jim, and I learned that from this young lady. That is a powerful lesson, and you put in the, uh, you know, the dean of, of all uh, Napoleon Hill, and I have done uh, six books for the Napoleon Hill Foundation, and I'm working on one right now that I'd like you and your audience to participate in, and the book is called Dear Napoleon, and people from all around the world, millionaires, billionaires, successful people, they're writing letters of thanks to Napoleon Hill. And it's just all you got to do is write a letter, Dear Napoleon, here's what I learned from you. Here's what it did in my life. And uh, it will help inspire a lot of people. It will help us all practice gratitude. And every nickel from that book will go to the Napoleon Hill Foundation to provide uh, college scholarships for kids and uh, 
and uh, I'll send you the information on it, Ricky, so you can be sure to be involved in it because I want you in that book and sharing what Napoleon Hill did for you. And anybody out there that wants to do it, you can just email your Dear Napoleon letter to jim at jimstovall.com, S-T-O-V-A-L-L, jim at jimstovall.com, and just put Dear Napoleon and tell him what he meant to you. Wow, that's awesome, man. You know, I love Napoleon Hill. I love the Napoleon Hill Foundation. The work that they're doing, they're still putting out this wonderful, great work, and he's still inspiring people. And he, you know, the thing about it, Jim, that he didn't think that he could do it at the beginning. In the right. beginning, he had to be convinced. And when he got started, man, when he really got rolling, he was rolling. He was rolling. Well, his work was so different from so many other people. A lot of people have theories, but Napoleon Hill was born in 1883, and he was a young newspaper reporter. He was actually there the day the Wright brothers flew, and then he was sent out to interview Andrew Carnegie, the founder and president of United States Steel, the richest man in the world at that time, and he'll ask the question you and I would probably ask, what do you got to do to get rich? And Carnegie explained no one has ever really quantified that, but if you'll dedicate the next 20 years of your life to studying this, you can be the one that unlocks the science of success. Hill took that challenge, and Carnegie introduced Napoleon Hill to you know, Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, Alexander Graham Bell, and 500 people, the most successful people of that time. 500 of these people he interviewed over the next 20 years, and then he synthesized all of that wisdom and experience in 1937 in a book called Think and Grow Rich that to this day is the best-selling book in the field of personal development. And uh, uh, several of us, Bob Proctor and I and uh, a handful of people, we got together and did a movie uh, last year called Think and Grow Rich, The Legacy, and it's just about what that book meant to us. And now through this Dear Napoleon project, you know, you and everyone listening to us can do that. And if you're sitting out there and you think, man, I've never read Napoleon Hill, it's not too late. Pick it up today. He will change your life and write a Dear Napoleon letter to Jim at jimstovall.com. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. That is awesome. Wow. So, you know, Jim, another area where a lot of people uh, drop the ball is this thing called service. Mm -hmm. Dr. King said the greatest among us are servants. Some people don't really understand that. Uh, they think, you know, being a servant is something subservient. Right. But, but Dr. King said the greatest among us are servants. I want you uh, to tell the story about the time you said you would go speak at different companies and corporations all over the world and some cities that you go into you would stop in the school and speak and teach and because you did that you met this well you you want to tell the story yeah i um you know i mean i started speaking for nothing and then a little more and a little more and now you know for an hour on stage doing something i love i i make more in an hour than the average family of four makes in a year in America. And I, because of that, I, I feel I have to be a good steward and I have to be uh, responsible with the gifts I've been given. You know, so for every speech I give where I'm paid, I do one for free. So I may be talking to 18,000 people in an arena somewhere. And then that, that next day I'm talking to 28 kids in a third grade class or something. And, uh, but it's, it's interesting. You still can never out give the system. You know, the universe is so much bigger than, than we imagine. And, uh, uh, two years ago I was out at the Ritz Carlton resort in, on Maui speaking to a group of um, business owners out there and i'd never heard of these people i didn't know why they hired me or anything and you know and so after it uh, the the promoter said would you mind having uh, a lunch with the uh, chairman of our board and i said no and it was an elderly lady she had inherited this company from her late husband and so I said, ma'am, I, I need to ask you, why did you hire me to come here and give this speech? I'm very grateful, but what was it? You know, did you read one of my books, see the movies? And she said, no, I frankly never heard of you, but my granddaughter lives in a little town called Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. And you came to her class, and she called me and told me that you were cool. 
And I looked you up, and I told our people to hire this guy. And so it's amazing. You know, you, you know, Ricky, I, I hear from people. I have 10 million books in print of my 48 titles, and my phone number or email address is in every one of those. So I hear from countless people around the world. And a lot of them say, you know, I want to make a lot of money. I want to make money. Well, Ricky, the only people that make money – work at the U.S. Mint. They print dollar bills. The rest of us have to earn money, and the way we earn money is by creating value in the lives of other people. So if you want to be successful, like Dr. King said, don't say, how do I go do something great? It's how do I serve more people? How do I make a bigger difference in their life? Because the world will give you fame and fortune and wealth and everything you ever wanted if you'll just care about them and solve their problems. But if you keep worrying about yourself and what you do or don't have, you, you're going to be broke your whole life. Wow. Hey, Jim, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that the first time I heard your name or heard about you was through an organization called the People's Network, TPN? Yes. That was a great, great organization. They put uh, videos on uh, the satellite and on cable TV of, uh, of motivational, informational speakers. And, uh, you know, it was a precursor to what's now available on YouTube and the Internet. And you can get all that stuff there. But, uh, you know, they packaged that in a way at that time that was just totally, totally unique. And uh, my great, late great friend Harlan Stonecipher uh, actually purchased that company and put it out there. And, uh, and later on I had him and Steve Forbes and, uh, Paula Marshall, uh, do a little cameo in a film, uh, uh, that, that I shot right there. And I shot it right there in your city and in New York and, uh, called the lamp with Louis Gossett Jr. And, uh, it was a lot of fun to, you know, put these real true life business icons in, in, in a movie. Wow, that is awesome. You know, I thought that company, I thought that idea was so brilliant. They had used it in the uh, multi-level marketing format, network marketing. I thought it was just a great idea. But to get people to buy satellites, that might have been a little bit challenging. But that whole concept, like if, if, if there was, like I, I like the concept of network marketing. I think it's a great way to help people to make a great living, I think, in my opinion. If there well, was for, the, a... for the right people, there, there, it is the, it is the one shot at the big time because uh, you can start with little or nothing, and uh, you can put sweat equity into a business and uh, and build it. And uh, if you're willing to go do that kind of work, it is amazing. Because, but the thing I always tell people about network marketing, network marketing is you got to be willing to do a lot of work you don't get paid for in the beginning. So someday you'll get paid for a yeah. lot of work you didn't do. And uh, and it's the same thing. You succeed when you help others. And uh, Zig Ziglar will always be remembered. His probably his most famous quote will always be: "You can have anything out of life you want if you'll help enough other people get what they want." And that is the definition of network marketing. Right. Wow. That that's it. You know, if there was a company that the whole theme or the whole what the company was selling was. Personal development, I think I would rather, I, it wouldn't be about making money for me, but I would jump in because I, I love it. I love it. I love personal development. I have a love affair with personal development. So I would jump in. It doesn't, doesn't matter like about oh, how much money I make. I would just let the benefits of, of, of studying personal development, I think is. Oh, I, I agree. And some of the top uh, network and direct sales companies are the biggest buyers of books in the world. Some of the larger organization, they buy books by the million. And uh, yeah. and they have really helped so many people with, uh, you know, getting their mind right and their attitude and personal development. Yeah. So, Jim, let's just say this guy from uh, Harlem, this guy with this radio program, decided that he wanted to start a revolution but the revolution would be a motivational revolution. How does a guy from Harlem start a motivational revolution? How do you how does how does he do that? Well, you do it the way other revolutions have started, with a handful of fanatics. 
And whether it's Jesus Christ or Benjamin Franklin or anybody that had a revolution going on, they they got a handful of people around them, and then they did that thing we talked about. They didn't just learn something. They didn't just teach something, but they taught people to teach. And when you teach people to teach, it never ends. It never stops. And, uh, you know, so that's what uh, creates a revolution. When, when people not only are the hearers of the word and the news, but they become the tellers of the story. And then it, it will take over the whole world. It's funny that you say that because I got a picture behind me right now and it's Jesus Christ. He's got 12 guys sitting with him. They, I guess they call disciples. So I think he started with 12, right? Right. And one of them went bad. I mean, he only had 11. Wow. Judas, <laughs> yeah, Judas Ooh. bailed out on him. So he, he, he made it with 11. Wow. Wow. That's the... So you don't really need thousands and thousands. Eleven. Yeah, That's eleven it. people. He changed the world. Okay. All right. I, I like that. I like that. that I really, uh, man, that is amazing. Now oh, you can go anywhere. This is a man who lived two thousand over two thousand years ago. He never traveled more than 100 miles from his home. He never wrote a book, never did a TV show, never did anything, never held a public office. But he shared a message of hope and possibility with 12 people. One of them went, went sideways on him. And those 11 people, but he taught them to teach. When you read his words, uh, you, know, you know, like when he was uh, teaching them how to do the Lord's Prayer, he said, go to them saying these words. And he taught them how to, you know, and, uh, you know, and my favorite, of course, is uh, when he healed the blind guy. And, and, the, the, and Jesus said, go to the next town and tell him. And the, the guy said, what should I tell him? He said, tell him I was blind and now I see. That's all you need to say. That's going to take care of it. <laughs> and and uh, so, you know, that's how you start a revolution. Now, I'm going to tell you something really... Uh, crazy, Jim. Mm -hmm. My birthday is July 7th. So my sister, one day I'm, talk I'm on the phone talking to my sister, and she tells me that my niece, her birthday has a special message in the Bible, 920, 923. So I'm like, oh, wow, that's okay. So I was like, I wonder what my birthday uh, says. And I looked it up. And it's in Matthew 7, 7. And it's, ask, and you shall be given. Yeah. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be open. I was like, you got to be kidding me. Not on my bed. I mean, what do, you, what do you think about that, John? That is like one of the most amazing uh, messages ever. And I love it. What do you think about that, John? Oh, it just powerful, powerful. And then he went on later in that chapter to say, you have not because you ask not. Ooh. And a po powerful, powerful message. And Ooh. then and then maybe the greatest words ever spoken that we need to remember in our world today, when there's so much wrong going on and so much injustice, and as he had given love and people had responded to him with hate, and as he was being nailed to a cross, and they took everything away from him, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And boy, that is, uh, that is some powerful words right there. And because when you start to see hate and people hurting as ignorance, and you, know, and you want to say, stop using me to ruin your life. You're ruining your life. You're filling your life with hatred. And Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Wow, that is, wow, that is really powerful. That is, that is powerful. Those, you know, I'm like, I'm almost speechless. But let me ask you, so here it is. I was a boxer. That's something that I did because I like the way it made me feel. It gave me confidence. But how do you take that art now, that art like that, and use it to inspire, empower people, uplift people? 
Well, well I think it's powerful. You know, confidence, you know, you mentioned the, the key word there, confidence. Confidence is, is, is knowing what you can do, but every time, you know, people... Um, they, they they get discouraged because sooner or later you get up and you don't feel like it. You don't feel like it. And I remember, well, you you were you were a boxer. You trained, and then boy, how many days you hit the gym? You don't feel like it. And my coach got a giant poster of the great Russian weightlifter Vasily Alexiev, the world champion at the time, and put it on the wall in the in the room where we trained. And and then uh, you know, and there were days I'd just say, Jacob, I don't feel like it today. He said, feeling ain't got nothing to do with it. And he, he said, how do you think he feels? You need eight points, uh, Alexia. He said, you think he feels like it every day? Feeling doesn't matter. Doing matters, you know. And uh, Ricky, we live in a world when it's all said and done. There's an awful lot said and very little done. And what people people are sick of hearing about it. They just want to watch it. You know, so if you want the world to follow you, if you want to create a revolution, all you do is just just go out and then make something happen, and the world will follow you. Because uh, uh, in a world of uh, far too little, uh, far too little done, and far too much said, a lot of people talking about it, and very few people actually doing it. Right. So, with that said, right now we're dealing with this thing called a pandemic. Yeah. And one of my people that I love, Napoleon Hill, says every adversity, there's an equal or greater benefit. Mm-hmm. So there's benefits here. I know Amazon, what I understand, they made millions of dollars. A lot of companies went on the business, but again, Napoleon Hill said every adversity, there's an equal or greater benefit. Most people look at the adversity instead of looking at, okay, where's the benefit here? Can you speak to that, Jim? Yeah, I mean, you, you've got to believe in that. And that's the, out of his 17 success principles, that's the one that first attracted me to Napoleon Hill because I, I found it when I was going blind. And, you know, he wrote, every adversity, every setback, every heartache is endowed with the seed of a greater good. And I thought that cannot be true. And I kind of set out to prove it wasn't true. And uh, here I am all these years later, and it's brought me success and happiness and peace and joy and all the things I ever wanted in my life. And it is true because, you know, Ricky, opportunities come disguised as problems. The whole world gets up every day, and they're praying for a good idea, and they trip over one about three times a week. The only thing you've got to do to have a great idea is go through your daily routine, wait for something bad to happen, and ask yourself, how could I have avoided that? And the answer to that question is a great idea. And the only thing you've got to do to turn your great idea into a great business is ask one more question. How can I help other people avoid that problem? Because the world will give you that fame and fortune and everything you ever wanted in this life if you'll just care about them and solve their problems. Because as in everything in this life, Ricky, it ain't about me and it ain't about you. GHCR, Grant House's Community Radio, home of the Community News Service. That is our station ID. And wow, that was a, a powerful statement, Jim. You know, most people, it's funny that they think about themselves. Like, for example, if you're on the airplane, Jim, the airline stewardess, when she gives instructions, she says, hey, put the mask on yourself first. Now, that in a case like that, you do have to look out for yourself first in order to take care of the other people. Can you speak to that? In reference to yeah, what I mean, said? If, you, if you don't get your mask on first, your oxygen mask, uh, you're going to die and won't be able to help anybody. And uh, uh, John F. Kennedy said in the year he was assassinated, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And that is something we have lost along yeah. the way because uh, everybody wants to know what's in it for me. What do I got to receive? And Winston Churchill said, we make we make a living based on what we get. We make a life based on what we give. And uh, the book I put out uh, this month, my 48th book, is called The Gift of Giving. And it's about me making a commitment when I had $1, and I made a million-dollar commitment. And it took me 38 years, but I finally wrote a million-dollar check. And it's the story of that, uh, you know, that transition from poverty to prosperity, from the bottom to the top. 
And, you know, all of my financial goals for many years, they haven't been about what do I get? I got everything I want. My financial goals are about how much can I give away? And we've sent 500 kids to college. We've had buildings we've built for uh, nonprofits. And then uh, this uh, million, actually a million and a half dollar donation to create the Stovall Center for Entrepreneurship and to help other young people um, who are going to college to get a degree in entrepreneurship or a master's degree. And that is, and that, that all started when I was, uh, I was 19 years old. I was in a chapel service at, at the university I attended, and they had a guy come from Africa. And he talked about his vision to dig water wells for these people that didn't have clean drinking water. And at the end of the, the, his talk, the president of the university said, I think we should take up a collection for this man to help. Well, I thought that was a great idea, except, Ricky, I only had $17 in the world. I had a $10 bill, a $5 bill, and two ones. But as the basket was being passed around, I got one of my ones ready to throw it in a basket. And as it got just two or three people away from me, the president of the university changed my life. He said, stop. Someone needs to hear this. Either give your best and expect the best or keep your money. You're going to need it. And one of the hardest things I ever did is I put my $1 bill up and I got out my 10. And, man, that could have been, you know, $10,000. But uh, I threw my $10 bill in there. I had $7 left in the world. I'm going blind. And I said, okay, if I'm going to expect the best, what does it look like? And I made a list of things, Ricky. And it started with I'm going to have my own company, and then I'm going to write a book, and then they're going to make a movie, and then I'm going to become a millionaire. And someday I'm going to find something I care about as much as that guy cared about those water wells, and I'm going to write a check for a million dollars. And it took me 38 years to get to that day, but that day happened, and everything on that list has happened. And it all started with a dollar that turned into $10 that turned into a million dollars. Wow, awesome. That is, that is, that's, that's it right there. That, that is it. One of the things I would like to do, Jim, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a radio book club. Mm -hmm. We're going to actually read certain book, a success book, a motivational book, a personal development book on the radio and, you know, the goals to improve lives. I'm kind of going back and forth for which book is going to be the the first book to start with. So I'm going back and forth. Do you have any uh, ideas? Well, I always tell people when they ask, you know, I've written 48 books. I'd love to tell you it's one of mine, but it's not. It, it, you know, it, Anybody, you know, if you haven't read Think and Grow Rich, you're not ready to get started. You know, you're not, uh, you know, and now after that, you can read a lot of books that have nuance and they do commentary on it and they build on Hill's work. But really, that's the, the basis of what we do, you know, and, uh, and um you know, I, 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 one of my first movies, they let me work on the soundtrack. So I put in, uh, you know, Bob Dylan and uh, Patsy Cline and B.B. King. And I got to work with B.B. King on uh, uh, one of his songs for the movie. And, and I, I was, he invited me to his 80th birthday party, you know, and, and I said, who do you listen to? Who inspires you? He said, a lot of great players, you know. And he talked about Buddy Guy. He talked about Eric Clapton. He talked about people that really inspired him. But he said, Jim, when, you really, when you're a blues player and you really want to get back to basics, you go back to the well. You go back to the original and you listen to Muddy Waters. And he said, that's where so much of what I do came from because he took the, the music and, and electrified it and he was the first one. Well, if you want to go back to the well of, of motivational speaking or writing, you go back to Hill's work. and Because uh, anyone that's written a book since that time uh, has based it greatly on his work. Wow. That's, uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, I... I, the last, one, one time we did an interview and I asked you to do me a favor. Now I'm going to reverse the favor. I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to do three pay it forwards in honor of Jim Stowe. I don't know what I'm going to do yet, but because you did three for me, uh, so now I'm going to do three pay it forwards for you in your honor. And when I do it, I'm going to say, hey, this is for the reason why I'm doing this is I'm dedicating this to pay it forward to Jim 
So we well, say about thank that. you. And and if everybody in the world would listen to that or listen to us right now and do what you're doing, follow your lead, do you know we would have a revolution in the world right now? Yeah. Yeah, because you did it for me. You did three, and you even wrote about them and told me about the three that, that you did. And uh, so now I think it's fair for me to do three pay it forwards in honor of you. Well, thank you, my friend. Yeah, that's one of my favorite movies, too. That movie... Uh, it's, it's really hard for me to watch that movie and tears not come down. It's a great, great film. An absolutely great film. Yeah. And, you know, that's the thing. And then, like, you yourself are a great storyteller. How did you become a great storyteller? You know, I'll, I'll, you know, I never thought I would be a writer. I, I was on this uh, tour, speaking tour, with Dr. Dennis Whaley and Dr. Robert Schuler, and the three of us were doing these West Coast events, and one day I'm backstage, and Dr. Schuler came up to me and said, uh, in that Dr. Schuler voice he had, made him sound like God or something. And he said, Jim, I think you ought to write a book. And I said, man, I can't read a book. Why should I write a book? And uh, I kind of dismissed it. I went out in the arena, did my hour. And when I came off stage, Dr. Whaley was standing there. And he said, hey, while you were out there, Schuler and I got it all worked out. And I thought he meant the ground transportation to the plane. I didn't know. I said, what'd you boys work out? And he said, well, uh, while you were out there, Schuler called his publisher, Thomas Nelson, and I agreed to write the foreword to your book, and we need a manuscript in 90 days. And so I came back to my hometown here in Oklahoma, and I, I wrote my, you know, losing my sight and building the television network and uh, the various things that have happened to me in my life. And I entitled it, You Don't Have to Be Blind to See, and it was things I learned through the process of losing my sight and uh, put it out. And it sold well, and they wanted another book and another book and another book. And uh, finally, after I'd written six or seven books, you know, Ricky, I'd written everything I knew and a few things I only kind of suspected. And when they said they wanted another book, I figured, man, i got to make something up here. I'm going to tell a story. And I decided to, to tell a story. I had I'd never written fiction before. And in the next five days here in my office, between my meetings and phone calls, I wrote The Ultimate Gift. And that story and there have been four books and three movies in that series and that changed my life those books and movies have grossed over a hundred million dollars and they have been all around the world in dozens of languages and uh, continue to impact people and that opened the door to many more books and many more movies but uh, just the possibility of uh, hey i'm going to try something and i mean nothing more absurd than you know i'm the guy that you know, I write books I can't read that are turned into movies I can't watch. And it's absurd when I sit down and think about it, so I don't think about it. I just go ahead and do it. Wow, that's pretty cool. I have been blessed to see in person and speak to, on both occasions, Jim Rohn. Yeah. And uh, so I listen to a lot of his uh, audio recordings, and one of the things he says is, I, I want you to break this down for me. What does he mean by this? Stand guard at the door of your mind. What does what does Jim Rohn mean by that? Well, what Jim Rohn was a master, and he understood that our mind is the greatest gift and the greatest force of nature. It will bring us anything we want, but unfortunately, many of us we our mind is like a sports car and. We're just, we're behind the wheel, but we're not steering. We're not taking advantage. We're not doing anything. And so we have this greatest force of nature out there, our mind, that will bring us anything we want. And if we don't engage that or, or point that in the right direction, what will happen is whenever we think of our goals or dreams or things we would like to do and have, our mind, in order to protect us, it comes up with an excuse. Well, you can't do that because you don't know anybody. Where would you get the money? And how would you do that? And you don't know anything about it. And, and then you go back and have a mundane, mediocre life. And that's what your mind will do if you don't direct it, just like that sports car will run in the ditch. But if you tell your mind, okay, starting right now, I want to succeed. I want to create value and live the life that I was destined to live. And and your mind doesn't care. It didn't say, fine, okay, if that's what you want now. And it will start to find ways to make that happen. It's just like if I say, uh, you know, 
uh, don't think of a pink elephant. You're thinking of a pink elephant right now. And if I say, hey, I just got a red car, you will see red cars today. Your mind will, will bring you whatever you're thinking about. And, it, you know, I'm looking for a contact. I need an idea. I'm looking for a concept. And, and you know, and then Jim Rohn taught us, I think his greatest statement was, you'll be the same person you are right now, except for two things, the people you meet and the books you read, and then his concept of you will become the sum total of the five people you hang around with the most. You you will start to talk like them, act like them, think like them. Your income will be the average of the five people you hang around with the most. And uh, some some people listen to us right now, they realize, man, i got to get an upgrade because uh, – you know, that influence will, will impact you greatly. It's why, you know, people don't like their kids to hang around with bad kids because right. uh, you become like who you hang around with. Right. Right. Uh, I think the thing that you were talking about is uh, the reticular activating system. Yep. I heard Bless Brown and a few other people talk about it. You said you think about a red card and you start seeing red cards all over the place. I think they call that your reticular activating system. Absolutely, and it, it 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 finds what you're looking for. It, it right. that's why a lot of enlightened football coaches right now they quit yelling at their people. Don't fumble the football because your mind immediately goes to the word fumble, and you start thinking about fumbling. And you <laughs> no, they, they tell you, hey, hang on to the football. A big big difference. And Zig Ziglar used to say that. You know, he said, don't be one of those parents that goes to the you know, door every day when your kids are walking away saying, don't get run over. Because, um, you know, I, I mean, th that's what you think about, you know. Right. And, uh, wow. And, you know, you, you, you've got to put things, and it's just like you corrected me earlier. Zig Ziglar had a celebration, a graduation, a party. He didn't have no funeral. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, when you, when that, but that's when you have lived a magnificent life, and you have impacted many, many people. Many, right, many and people. that impact is what you leave behind. You know, uh, uh, Zig talks about going to a, a very wealthy guy's funeral, and one of the other people that was there with him says, wow, he was one of the richest guys in the world. He said, how much do you think he left? And Zig said, I guarantee you, I know exactly how much he left. He left it all. You don't That's get right. to take any of it with you. But the right. impact you leave behind is that impact when you teach people to teach, you change the world. So we talked about Jesus, which is like, I think that's like real cool. I'm not, I, you know, I'm not a guy that went to church. Uh, but to talk about Jesus and to make me feel so good talking about him today and, him, you know, you sharing that message. But now I want to talk about Moses because, uh, when I started this radio program, I was doing segments, and the guy that was uh, the guy that was putting together our shows or organizing our shows, Wally Wally Nurikam is his name. He said to me, he said, "You have to come up with a name for your segment." And I I I stood there. I was like, and I don't know why I said this, Jim. I really don't know to this day why I said it. I know where I got it from. I was watching uh, this guy's Gil Noble show. He used to come on Sundays at 1 o'clock. So Sundays and Saturdays at 1 o'clock. He had a show called Like It Is. And he did a segment on Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Yep. And at the end of that, at the end of that uh, program, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. said, he, they showed him doing a, uh, a speech. And the name of the speech was called, What's in Your Hand? And mm -hmm. I said, when Wiley asked me to come up with a name, I said, what's in your hand? That's what this came to, I just said it. And so that comes to what God said to Moses. Moses said that he, how am I going to lead these people? I can't even speak. How am I going to lead these people? And God said, what's in your hand? So that's right. the name of my radio program that's been for over 12 years now. Yeah, 12, no, 12, 13 years, 13 years. What's in your hand? Mm -hmm. I think that's a powerful message. So when you hear, when you think about Moses, you think about what's in your hand, Jim, what becomes present for you? Well, whether you read the scriptures or anything else, or you just watch life unfold the way it's been created, 
no one was ever given a calling, a dream, an ambition, a goal that didn't have the capacity to achieve it. The God that made heaven and earth and everything you and I will ever do and know and have would not have put that dream inside of you and me and everyone listening to us right now if we did not have the capacity to achieve it. Uh, that's just like when you tell your child to do something. You don't tell them to do something they can't do. You know, hey, jump off the roof and fly. You don't tell your kid that. You tell them to do things that they can do. Now, they may not believe they can do it when you're telling them, but they can do it. Well, the same thing is true in life that we live. You know, that dream, that calling, the biggest dream you ever had in your life is alive and well. And, you know, a lot of people, they haven't thought about it in 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 years. Uh, you know, when we were little kids or young adults, we all believed in everything. Man, I'm going to be this, do this, have this. I'm going to create the world. I'm going to change everything, man. I'm going to make a difference. And then somewhere between there and here, we got so busy making a living that we forgot to create a life. Well, I get up every day in the dark, and I come out to tell people the light, which is simply this. The biggest dream you ever had in your life is alive and well. And you may not have thought about it in 20 years, but the only thing you got to do to activate it right now is go into that little voting booth in the middle of your soul that only you and God knows about, and you reach up there and you grab that handle that says yes, and you vote for yourself, and your whole world will change starting today. Because the only people that get a vote are you and God, and once you vote for yourself, you'll find out he voted for you a long, long time ago. He's been waiting on you. And, and you know that dream, that goal, that calling, the biggest thing you can think of is within your grasp. It's in your hand. You have everything you need. And, and, you know, and you mentioned Napoleon Hill. One of his things is start with the tools you have right now. Even if they're broken, worn out tools, the tools in your hand, start with those tools. And as your journey continues, you'll be provided with better tools. Awesome. But, awesome. you know, you hit the nail on the head when you, when you titled this show 13 years ago. What's in your hand? What's in your hand is all you need to get started. But see, too many people, they're waiting for all the lights to be green before they'll leave the house. It doesn't work that way. You take right. your first step, and then, and then it'll be there. And even when Moses, uh, who you mentioned, was crossing the desert, I mean, he got manna. He got food from heaven every day. If God had given him all the food for the whole trip, it would have spoiled and gone bad, and he never had it. And that's why we pray, give us, give us this day our daily bread. And then, and then, to, and then tomorrow's wow. bread will be there tomorrow. Wow. 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 Man, I mean, time is flying, Jim. What do you think about the, pro the problem today between the Democrats and the Republicans? They, for some reason, they just can't get along. You know, there's too many people... You know, I'm looking for patriots. I'm looking for people that believe in our system and will step forward and make a deal. You know, and we don't have to agree. For many years, I did a show in Washington, D.C. called The Washington Reporter. And uh, I remember, uh, you know, I used to think people across the aisle from me uh, were evil, bad people that wanted to ruin our country. And then I got to know a number of them. And I realized these are good people. They, have a, they may have a little different vision on how we ought to get there, but they all want to get to the same place and do the same thing. And you look back in history, you know, uh, Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton didn't agree on anything. Newt was Speaker of the House when Clinton was president. But they sat down and they made a deal, and, and, they, and they, they put the people in front of them. Uh, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill never agreed on anything that I'm aware of. But they would sit down and make a deal of not what was good for Reagan, not what was good for Tip O'Neill, but for, 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 you know, for both of them. And uh, when Tip O'Neill retired, people were shocked that Reagan showed up. And he said, I want to give the toast for Tip O'Neill as he retires. And his toast went like this. It said, if I had a ticket to heaven, but you didn't have one too, I'd sell my ticket to heaven and go to hell with you. And that's what he believed. He said, this is the kind of man that I've been to hell with, I've been to heaven with, and we didn't agree on how to get anywhere, but we agreed on where we wanted to go, and we made a deal for the American people. And that's what I'm hoping to hear out of some of these parties. You know, and I'm really tired of the finger pointing. I'm really tired of, you know, well, you don't want to vote for him. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, that, that's the worst thing. I mean, the best thing you can tell me about yourself is you're not him. Uh, I mean, uh, 
No, tell, share your vision for our country, and so everybody can participate and be a part of this system. Our country is so big and powerful, and the ideal of capitalism and success is there for everybody. And so I'm hoping in the next uh, 60 days before this election, we'll start to see some of that come together. That's pretty good. Now, one of the things, Jim, um, anybody that steps on a football field, as far as I know, I'm not an expert in football. I like it. I enjoy watching watching it. Uh, but every team has a playbook. Why yeah. don't human beings have a playbook for their life? I know some people say the Bible is a playbook, but you know everybody's not reading the Bible. But why don't we have a playbook for a successful life? Yeah, you got to have a playbook. You got to know where it is you want to go. You got to know where the goal line is, and then you got to start building your team. And uh, Napoleon Hill called it a mastermind group. But you got to start building a team. I mean, who's going to help you get there? And, and and it's not just about you getting there. When you get there, they get there too. The whole team gets points. And right. and you got to get the right people on your team. When I was uh, going to college, I was recruited uh, to go to a lot of places. And one of the places I visited was the University of Alabama. I didn't really want to go to the University of Alabama, but that was the last year Bear Bryant was there, and I wanted to meet Bear Bryant. And I'll never forget, I walked out on the field. It was just me and him. And he said, you're from Oklahoma. He said, you and I both know you're not going to come to the University of Alabama. Why are you here? I said, I wanted to meet you. And he said, well, let's don't waste our day then. And he walked with me down to the goal line, and he handed me a football. And he said, son, always remember this. There's only two kinds of people in the world. There are the kind of people that will get this ball in that end zone, and then there's the people that won't. And they got an excuse, they got a reason, they got a whatever. You know, somebody missed their block, somebody slipped, I didn't get the handoff, I didn't get it. And, and, but for whatever reason, they won't. Now, the other people, they may slip, somebody misses their block, but they are going to get that ball in that end zone because they have been to the mountaintop. They have seen the vision, and they know they are going to end up in that, in that end zone right there. And he said, for, for God's sake, son, when you leave here, Surround yourself with those kind of people that are going to get that ball in that end zone and make sure you always be one of those kind of people. Wow, there it is. There it is. Uh, one, one last thing, Jim. A, a lot of people, you talked earlier about how children, when, you, when you're on the stage, you ask children, can they do this, can they do that? You know, you, you get them. Then the adults, you get a, a few handfuls. And one of the things people shut down their creative imagination, that creativity, that imagination, they have a problem, they have an issue. How, how can people, especially as adults, pull out that creative imagination? Well, you know, basically it's a matter of getting out of the way. We put too much structure around these kids and they're, they're, they're overstimulated with screen time. You know, I think they need to spend a lot of time reading or watching documentaries. They need to learn about people right where they were that 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 uh, that uh, got out and did what they wanted to do. The reason I started the Stovall Center for Entrepreneurship at the college I attended is I want to be there. I have an office there, and I go there quite. I'll be there tomorrow lecturing, and I tell those kids, look, this isn't some theory for me. I'm not some guy that came from Mars or the other side of the moon. I started out right here. I lived in that dorm room right down there, and I sat here when, with $7 in my pocket and a dream. And there's never been anybody more broke or scared than I was, going blind. I've got nothing going on in my life. But I had a dream that someday I would come back here and give a million dollars. And the reason you're here in this Center for Entrepreneurship is that's what happened. But I want to see you have that dream. Well, the thing you can do best for kids is show them someone right here, someone that they, they, they went and did that, you know, and, and there are so many examples of that. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, young ladies need to read about uh, Oprah Winfrey, young men need to read about, read about Elon Musk or, or Bill Gates or whoever it is, it doesn't matter. But these are real life people that, uh, if, if, I mean, if you scratch them, they bleed, and if you look behind the, the facade, these are very normal people with right. extraordinary dreams. And if the right. dream is big enough, the facts don't count. Wow, that's right. 
Jim, final question. Uh, I'm wearing a cap right now that says keys to success. Give me three keys to success. Um, I have a poster in my office at home. It's four feet long with, it says success is, and it lists them down through there. And, uh, and, uh, number one on the list is marry the right person. <laughs> you get involved, you, you wake up every day and go to bed every day with the wrong person. It's impossible to succeed. Miss Crystal gave me the greatest gift everyone, anyone's ever given me. She believed in everything I've ever wanted to do. And, uh, man, when you got a cheerleader like that, you succeed. Number two is surround yourself with the kind of people you want to be. And number three, realize that you'll be the same person you are today, except for the books you read and the people you meet. It's all there. It's all, I mean, you know, if you can, you know, go meet people and say hello, and if you got a library card, you can get everything you ever want in life. I mean, it's all right there. The most brilliant people in the world are, they wrote down their best stuff, and they gave it to you. And all you got to do is do that. And even in the middle of this pandemic, uh, most libraries have an online deal. You can get all these books for free. They're right there. And they'll tell you how to do it. And, you know, people need to listen to you on your show every week because, uh, I mean, you are leading the way and you're creating that uh, success of, uh, of revolutionary success. Wow. Hey, Jim, I want to thank you. This interview was definitely a knockout. It was so – I have to put my gloves back on because this interview was definitely a knockout. Thank you, Jim. Hey, it's you always a privilege, and I look forward to our next time together, my friend. All right. Talk to you soon. You're making a huge difference, man, especially in my life. Well, thank you. You are, too. Be well. All right. Talk to you soon, Jim. Okay. All right. All right.